Hey there, folks. This is Screen Watching. My name is Dan Barrett, joined by Mel Campbell. Very excited by this. We'll meet Mel in just a moment. On the show this week, uh, we're doing the reviews. We're talking about the TV. We're talking about the movies. It's just what we do here. So I'm going to talk about a brand new Australian TV comedy. That's a polite term. It's called Court. It's debuted on Stan. It's got some American stars. It's got some Australian actors. Uh, we've got that. There's also the new Henry Sugar program that's dropped. It's a 39 minute movie slash TV special directed by Wes Anderson. That's on Netflix. And then Mel's going to be talking about The Creator, which is in cinemas now. And I should have confirmed this with her earlier. I'll see if she would nod at me. Uh, While the Men Were Away, the new SBS TV drama. Yes, thumbs up. There we go. (laughs) Okay, folks, this is screen watching. We're going to dive right in in just a moment. This is not like TV only better. Television, teacher, mother. Secret lover. What, that's it? That's your movie? Well, I said that I had an idea for it. My name is Dan Barrett. I'm here every damn week, but excitingly, Simon's away. And when Simon's away, Dan will play someone I've been wanting to have a chat with and just rope into something at some point for years now is Mel Campbell, Victorian TV or movie TV critic and woman about town. Mel, how are you doing? I'm fantastic. Dan, thank you for having me on your podcast. I love this chance to to have a chat with people about the film and the TV that I've been watching. And, you know, I don't get that enough anymore. So thank you very much. Yeah, look, we were having a bit of a chat beforehand. And something that became really apparent to me is that Mel is based out of Melbourne. There's Melbourne critics, there's Sydney critics, and then there's mm. people like myself on the outskirts of the country who occasionally get thrown a bone by movie and TV distributors around the place. But it just kind of feels like there's different vibes and we all hang out in different circles. So a chat like this, it's kind of fun to bridge the divide. Yeah, absolutely. The only other time I ever really interact with critics from outside Melbourne is uh, I semi-regularly do um, the Richard Glover um, ABC Sydney afternoon, oh, sorry, drive um, critics segment that they have every week. Sometimes yeah. I'll be the movie person, sometimes I'll be the TV person. But that's really only the only other time that I interact with people who aren't, you know, the Melbourne critics, because it can get quite cosy in these scenes. Yeah, I found a couple of weeks where I was being invited onto the Glover segment with um, like alarming regularity. And then I had a quiet conversation with them afterwards and I viewed some of my opinions about something and then I was never invited back. Uh oh. <laughs> Dare I ask what kinds of opinions they were? Oh, look, I mean, I've got lots of opinions in the world. No, 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 like one of the things that just kind of bothers me is this conversation that takes place that's driven largely by Australian TV producers more than anyone else. But like it's sort of broadly accepted amongst sort of uh, social sort of uh, people who are interested in culture. The idea that the international streaming services like Netflix or, you know, uh, Paramount or whoever should be required to produce so many Australian programs each year. And my opinion on that is that uh, while, yes, that would be nice, I don't think that's the most effective way to actually get what I think the desired outcome is, which is content that actually reflects Australia. Okay, but the other sort of, and this was probably my talking point at the time, which was in Australia, we were forcing TV networks to produce a certain amount of like P and C classified programs and so much Australian content each year. But part of the reason for that was that they were getting broadcast licenses and they were actually required if they wanted to keep broadcasting to broadcast certain types of things. But the streamers, we're not licensing them. Like it's not the same sort of an environment. So what right really do we have to say, this is what you need to be producing outside of this is part of a cultural imperative. It just kind of feels a little bit funny to me. So I, I'd never really heard a good argument against that. Okay. And suddenly on the quiet conversation I was having with Richard in the hallway, he didn't really provide that. But at the same time, and look, it could be complete coincidence. Like maybe I was just no good, but you know, I had been there a bunch of times and the one time I talked to him suddenly, not there anymore. Well, it's weird that you talk about Australian content, which I notice a lot because I review a lot for Screen Hub and mm. they're basically like only interested in Australian content. And I often find myself reviewing the TV shows um, rather than the movies. Because and people like to see them. That's right. I mean, and in one way it's kind of exciting to see the range of different things that streamers are producing 
whether it's, um, you know, traditional dramas and comedies or um, there have been interesting formal experiments. Um, I mean, some of those, of course, do come from ABC and SBS. And in fact, some of the most interesting ones do. Um, but look, you have to wonder if there wasn't this culture of a certain requirement to produce Australian content for the Australian market, would they do it? I mean, Heartbreak High was one of Netflix's biggest hits, but we've got to remember that um, Australia's just such a tiny market for a lot of these, um, you know, international streaming services that sometimes it can seem that if you just look at the number of people who are going to look at this, if they're only Australian people, then it's not worth it. And that's why maybe we get some of this stuff that feels a little bit more you know, not Australian stories, but stories that can make sense to a larger international audience. Like, for instance, um, on Disney Plus, they've got Koala Man, which is in one way deeply, deeply Australian, but in another way, it kind of trades off this stereotype and about Australians that maybe people outside Australia will be fascinated with. Um, and then you have the phenomenon, which is in that um, show that you're about to review, Court, where you bring in a lot of different international stars and have them kind of hanging around in a show that's ostensibly an Australian show, but it's to give it appeal. And you do see that sometimes with the uh, the co-productions, like Stan does a lot of co-productions with, um, you know, BBC and stuff like that. So you'll see essentially a lot of headline actors are not Australian, but the show does seem to count as Australian somehow. Yeah, like the most egregious one of those ones is a show that was on Channel 10 called Spreadsheet, sorry, uh, Paramount Plus, called Spreadsheet. So this was a British production filmed in Melbourne, and effectively it was about a woman who was British, and I'm 90% sure the actress was the lady from the IT crowd, whose name I can't quite remember. Oh, yeah. Mm, yeah, I can't remember it either. Yeah, question without notice. Uh, Catherine something. What was I you want to say Catherine Tate because she's a redhead, but it's not yeah. her. No, but it's Catherine with a K, I'm pretty sure. And I, I want to say it's mm. Catherine Parkinson, but I'm not quite sure that's right. So anyway, this was a TV show shot in Melbourne. And you could tell it was Melbourne because I've been in Melbourne and I know what Melbourne looks like. Okay. And it was clearly sort of Melbourne culture, but at no point did they ever make any reference to a location that's around. Like it could just as well have been in London. It could have been in Melbourne. Who can really say for sure? Like it was just kind of yeah. no, man, no man's land. And that's kind of Catherine the problem. Catherine Parkinson. With... It is Catherine Parkinson. There we go. Yeah. yeah. So this is part of the problem I've got with a lot of the overseas productions that are ostensibly for a global market and that you actually lose the originality of the location that it's from. Like it loses a authenticity that is no longer there. So you watch a lot of Netflix things from, you know, various sort of Scandi countries or whatever. Very rarely do they actually talk about locations they're from. You hear references to like the university or something like that. And it's always mm. never named. It's just like a concept or a structure. And so a lot of the cultural uh, markers you find in a relationship to really understand how because like an education system in Australia is quite different to an education system in Finland, for example. Okay, and the way that teachers and students all relate to each other will be quite different. And so that's reflected in the content, but like it's sort of, you don't really understand that context because they don't really talk about location with any specificity at all. And you get these global things like Heartbreak High could just as easily have been filmed in Detroit as it is in Australia. Uh, like people talk about, oh, it's got the authenticity of Australian language through it, but it was just kind of all made up like fun sort of youth speak that could just as well be coming from the U S as it is in Australia. Like it wasn't well, really explicit. Like it didn't feel authentically Aussie. That's true. But at the same time, um, culture generally has got a lot more transnational. And so yeah. in particular youth culture and the language that people use, people are watching, you know, TikTok or other platforms. They're sharing all the same content, no matter where they're from. So maybe that's what a show like Heartbreak High is reacting to. But I wanted to mention the way that sometimes it goes the other way in that it's this exaggerated Australianness. You know, like Home and Away had such a massive following in the UK because it was this fantasy of living in the Australian beach, right? Yeah, and I thought maybe them, like that and Neighbours, both shows that were made in Australia ostensibly for Australians, but that was never really the case. It was always being made for that UK market. 
Yeah, I mean, and the same uh, can be said for Surviving Summer, which is on Netflix, yeah. uh, which is filmed, I'm quite familiar with the area that it's filmed. It's along the Great Ocean Road in Victoria and um, some of the towns down there on the surf coast, it's called, like from Bells Beach further southwest. And uh, it's so clearly shot um, in the place that it's talking about, but they give it a fake name. Like the real town is called... Um, uh, oh, I forgot. I forgot what the real town's called, but the, they call it Shore Haven, um, but it's called uh, Sea Haven. I've, I'm going to need to go back after I've checked this out, but um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but hang on a second. Um, edit all this stuff out, Dan. No, keeping <laughs> so it in. This sound, is real. This is what the people need so to I hear. So I sound more knowledgeable <laughs> than I am. Fair Haven. So Fair Haven. There we go. Um, yeah. So. Uh, Surviving Summer was filmed around Anglesey, Fairhaven, Lawn, those places, um, but they call it Shorehaven in the TV show. So um, it's clearly a particular place, um, but it also trades off this idea of what people think Australia is like. And it's been interesting for me, knowing the area so well, to hear what reviewers and um, viewers who are writing reviews, whether they're not professional reviews, they're Google reviews or Rotten Tomatoes reviews, IMDb reviews, um, mm. they tend to think that it's either in Perth or it's in Queensland. They don't realise that it's in Victoria because to them uh, Victoria is Melbourne and that's really all we have. Uh, but we, we have mm. a, like a surf scene. And it's it, like if you're a surfy person, like Bells Beach is like one of the um, pilgrimage sites if you're a, a surfer. Um, also, another similar example. Mel, we've is- all seen Point Break. We all know how amazing <laughs> it is. That's right. Oh, apparently people um, actually in the area got so mad when it was meant to be Bell's Beach when it was actually Hawaii. Um, yeah. I, another example I'm thinking of is, I don't know if you ever saw um, this show La Brea, uh, was it Channel Oh, 10? yeah, yeah. Uh, channel, uh, channel 9. Oh, was it Channel 9? I thought it was Channel 10. Nah, Channel um, 9 had the last that one. Yep. And that was filmed in rural Victoria, but it was meant to be kind of primeval California, which I thought was a really interesting use of the place. Like they're trying to find somewhere that looks kind of familiar but also strange to the presumptively American viewers out there because obviously they can't shoot it in California now. It would look weird and phony because the climate's totally different now from what it would have been in, uh, you know, the primeval times. But, yeah, it was so strange for me to see Australian eucalypts and, you know, granite <laughs> outcrops of the sort from picnic and hanging rock, etc. cetera, um, but in an American show. See, that kind of works because you are dealing with, you know, a couple of hundred thousand years difference with evolution and, you know, uh, obviously it's not going to be in, in a, like Los Angeles in the way that, you know, the opening sequence in La Brea is. But, like, you contrast that against, uh, gosh, what was the name of it? Nine Perfect Strangers, which is the Amazon series fronted by Nicole mm-hmm. Kidman. This is a show which is supposed to be set in modern-day Southern California, but you're seeing those eucalypts sort of in the background of every scene. It was quite clearly Byron Bay. Why not just set it in Byron Bay? Like, there was really no reason why you couldn't get away with that. Yeah, there was something that really bothered me about that show. Um, oh, that was that, very good? Well, yes, there's that too. Yeah. Um, but there was one character who had a name that they pronounced in a really different way than we would pronounce it in Australia. And the thing is, you've got to remember, Leanne Moriarty wrote it. She's an mm. Australian author. And so um, basically, like, I'm thinking as an Australian um what was the character's name? I'm trying to remember. Um, it was like, mm. oh, Carmel. That's what it was. So we're Australian and we say Carmel, which is like your aunt's name. Um, yeah, yeah. But they, call, they called her Carmel, which is, was so weird every time I heard it. I can't deal with Americans saying Craig. It's Craig. <laughs> it's, it's too much for me. Right. Anyway, look, we probably need to dive in and start talking about Court, yes. which is this brand new series, which, as you teased a moment ago, has a whole bunch of Americans in it. Anyway, it's streaming now on Stan. Let's watch a clip. Hopes are fading tonight for four Australian soldiers missing in the island nation of Bahati, Queensland. Americans. We're not American. <laughs> We're Australian, <laughs> like, uh, like, like, like Crocodile Dundee. Yeah, or- the Mel Gibson. Yeah. 
Early Mel Gibson. So Mel, I don't know about you, but I've had a lifelong fascination with Kick Gurry. Uh, my interest only because who gets around named Kick Gurry? Outside of that, I've got no real interest in him, but he's a fascinating name. What's your favorite yeah. Kick Gurry performance? Look, I my knowledge of Kick Gurry is limited to essentially three texts. Looking okay, for Ale- Looking for Ella Brandy. Yeah. Um, Edge of Tomorrow, and this Court. That's all. He was in okay, something actually- else. So I've got a couple of others. Sorry, I'd forgotten about looking for Ali Brainy, but I absolutely saw him in that. He was also in the Alex Proyas film Garage Days, if you oh, remember. Oh, yeah. That. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, he was the lead in that. And also he's in the David Mamet film Spartan. There's a sequence where Val Kilmer is engaging in some sort of overseas mission and suddenly like this sort of Navy SEAL type character or like ex-Navy SEAL gets involved. And it's Kit Gary appearing in it for like about 35 seconds on screen. But outside of that, like, who knows who Kit Gary is? And here we are in 2023. He's not only starring in this Australian series for Stan called Court, which is spelt like MASH with the little apostrophes throughout the word Court. Uh, he's not only just starring this, but he's also written it and directing it. And, like, I don't understand how that's happened. What, what sort of upside yeah, down? Yeah, it's, it's a mystery, isn't it? Um, well, what did you think of it? Did you like it? Uh, look, I wanted to like it. I don't know. There was something about it where I'm like, you know what? This could be a bit of a fun lark, and it just isn't. Uh, the premise of this one is that there's a group of Australian um, special forces types that have been hired to go under a very special mission that can't really be spoken of in any sort of official capacity. Anyway, that's supposed to go to a woman's uh, house in a fictional far-off land, um, it seems like an Indonesian sort of a country, but I'm not really quite sure exactly where it's supposed to be. Uh, but certainly they're supposed to go to her house, distract her, delete a photo off her phone because apparently the cloud doesn't exist and get out of there and not to be detected. But while they're there, they bump into some American soldiers who are on the ground as well as the, you know, locals who well and truly capture them and think they're Americans and are prepared to execute them. And so they're like, no, 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 we're Australians. Everyone loves Australians. And at that point, I wasn't sure I loved Australians anymore because I had struggled with the 10 minutes leading up to that point. Yeah, look, I liked the silliness of the show. And Mm. I think that you're going to be disappointed if you're expecting it to actually do justice to the tropes that it's taking the piss out of. Like, the soldiers are clearly incompetent and they're referred to repeatedly as idiots. Um they the mission is ridiculous as you mentioned like why don't they just remotely delete it in fact um I, the first laugh i had i think in this no the second laugh was when the there's always a headset guy in these kinds of movies the headset <laughs> yeah. guy um is trying to delete the the photos and clippy comes up on his computer screen saying it looks like you're trying to hack an iphone i laughed at that point because the my bar for humor is like so low like i i enjoyed this once i realized oh it's dumb it's stupid it's not meant to be like a a good show um and from that point on like even though the whole premise of it doesn't even really make sense if you think about it for more than one second i just found it stupid and, and enjoyable i don't know like what was what were you struggling with so I don't mind stupid. I can handle stupid really quite well, but I think that stupid also needs a bit of an internal logic to it that kind of feels like you want to go along with the ride. Where it lost me was the very beginning where you suddenly saw, sorry, it opens with a video of, and it's the sort of video we've all seen before, which like the hostage situation with some soldiers that have been captured and, you know, there's um, usually, it's usually some sort of a Muslim sort of a thing. That's kind of the vibe of these videos we're used to seeing. And it's a fake version of one of those. And you've seen the production of it behind the scenes and I've staged this video. Okay. But as we said at the very beginning, it looks like it's an authentic video and you see the entire world sharing it around. The What really just like frustrated me from the very beginning is as this sort of sequence is taking place, this is where your world building is happening. This is where you're buying its legitimacy of what's taking place. And for some reason, the entire global media seems to exist of people that star on the Today program, okay, which I found a little bit sort of difficult. But also there's just this line by um, Carl Stefanovic, who is in this more than you'd expect, 
And he just says something along the lines of, oh, I've never seen anything that's sort of this horrific before or something like that. And there was nothing in the video that was particularly that horrific. And it just sort of seemed like it was just a bit lazy. Like, I appreciate that it's going for dumb, but you don't have to be lazy while you're being dumb. And it was just those little moments kept on being repeated every couple of moments where, like, I don't know, I just couldn't really buy into the world at all. I didn't want to buy into the silliness of it because it just seemed like it was insulting my intelligence at every turn. Right. I think that I often struggle with Australian stuff that's trying for that glossy uh, standard that we get from international um, productions and we can see that it's using the same tropes. But because it's Australian, it's always just a little bit shit. Do you know what I mean? (laughs) Like if it was American, they would actually have, you know, um, I don't know, Rachel Maddow or someone being the newsreader or yeah. like Anderson Cooper. But we, because we're Australian, we get Carl Stefanovic. And so that's kind of, we have to settle for like the slightly shit version of everything being Australian. So, so is. Like, I reckon if you're watching a US one, and I'm going to place it back a couple of years just so we've got some like points of contact that are, you know, universal, um, they'd always have the montage where you'd see Jay Leno doing The Tonight Show, and then you'd go to Wolf Blitzer at CNN, and then you'd also see, like, um, I don't know, third other, like, prominent news person from, like, NBC or something. And, like, that's fine because it's actually a spread of media. But all three of them coming from Channel 9 personalities because it's a stand production, like, that just kind of, you know, it just takes it that little bit out. But they always do that, though. Like, you know, if it's a universal one, they'll always have NBC people um, just because of the corporatization of the, the media. Like you're watching an Apple TV show and everyone's using Apple phones and computers. Like, See, I never noticed the Apple thing at all. It just never happens. Oh, well, I, I don't because I'm an Apple person. I'm talking <laughs> yeah. to you right now on Apple products, right? But it just occurred to me while I was watching um, uh, Still Up just recently that I was like, yep. oh, yeah. They're, they're on all these Apple products because it's an Apple it's show. An Apple yeah. Yeah. Uh, there was one sequence I quite liked, you know, which was, and I'm not going to get past this first episode. I, I'd like <laughs> to think I'd sit there and watch a second episode, but I know it's not going to happen. Uh, there's a sequence of the first episode where the Australians, uh, just after their mission, they're in a van and they come across the Americans. So Matthew Fox and this other guy um, are the lead American sort of um, figures here. Oh, sorry, I'm going to swing back and talk about Sean Penn in a moment as well, because that scene mm. was just terrible. But anyway, uh, there's a scene where they're in this van. They come across Matthew Fox. Matthew Fox uh, is basically ripping into them for just being a bit shit. Um, they are calling the Americans dickheads. And it was this fun sort of real thing that felt sort of authentic and Australian. I like scenes where you see characters who sort of step outside of their expected sort of tropes for a moment and you see a bit of humanity as to how they interact. I like it reminds me of... The best case I've got for this is always super bad. There's these sequences at the beginning of the film where you see the kids before they go on their night out, uh, their nights out. They're just at like the school and you just sort of see like the final sort of, you know, they're in like the last two weeks of school or something. So it's all very loose and lazy. But you just see like all their sort of previous relationships come out as they just call each other dickheads and aren't really sort of engaging with them in like an expected manner. Like you're seeing a bit of authenticity, a bit of their humanity actually being exhibited on screen. And I like that about the van sequence, but then they just kind of lost it after that. It sort of seemed as though the characters got a bit silly. There's a sequence where for no reason then other than the jump joke, they've been captured by their captors. Uh, They've been thrown into a pit and they're all naked for some reason or resting on each other's cocks. Uh, Like, you know. Yeah, that was gratuitous. It's not there. And so that it kind of spoke to what the show is doing. It's just these constant sort of, efforts to go for the cheapest laugh possible without earning the cheap laugh. Yeah, I think I'm kinder to it than you are because I just really enjoyed like the the first laugh that I had was when, and when it really clicked to me, oh, this is going to be really stupid was um you know that classic um spy movie trope of it's nighttime, it's at the the place that our heroes are having to infiltrate and you'll see some guards just kind of moving around, maybe talking to each other, just these yeah. NPC kind of guards and you see this one guy and he's wearing the most ridiculous gold lame raja hat and then he says on his radio my hat was in there and that <laughs> that's the, that made me laugh a lot and uh and it just made me think oh right this is the the caliber of humor we're going for and also just in a later episode so you won't ever watch this Dan, but, um, <laughs> 
like Brian Brown is the prime minister um, and he's like the most awful caricature of every like dumb, ugly Australian um, cliche. But uh, he gets told by the US ambassador, oh, the president um, is on the phone or something. And, and Brian says, what does that cunt want? And that just made me laugh as well. Like, imagine Australian leaders ever actually talking to the US president, like, in those kinds of terms. I think that those, those sorts of moments I enjoyed. But I agree that some things were weird, like that sort of the pit full of bums and dicks. Like, that just felt like gay panic to me. Uh, yeah, so I didn't like that so much. It, looks, it throws lots of stupid jokes at the wall. Some of them are in better taste than others. I am still, I've, I've now actually watched three episodes of it because I enjoyed it. And You're in now. you got to watch it through. Uh, yeah, yeah. And they're only half hour episodes. So like, yeah, I found it pretty, pretty easy to watch. But um, like, what is Sean Penn's character? Like, I don't know, even understand what the deal was with Sean Penn being humiliated in the opening episode on the Today Show. Um, yeah, I'm very confused about that. Maybe it will become clear later on, like, how he's involved in it. Um, again, it's it's the kind of show that I would not recommend that you, you know, devote too many brain cells to. But, like, it's definitely the kind of thing where you can just have it on in the background and just be sort of laughing the most, like, brain cell free laugh of your life while you watch. Yeah, I don't know. I always come to this idea we're on peak TV still and there's so many better ways you could be spending your time. It's true. Like, I do feel very kind of panicky almost sometimes when I think about all the shows that I'd like to watch and the limited amount of time I have. I'm, like, at my wit's end basically just keeping up with the release date so that I can, you know, keep up with the the new TV cycle, which is what we always have to review. Like I'd love to go back and watch something from even like earlier this year, but I don't know when I'm going to have time to do that. Well, this is what I've enjoyed about the strikes in that it's kind of really slowed down the TV release, uh, release schedule. So there's been a few more opportunities to go back and catch up on a few of those shows where I saw the first three episodes of and just never got back to it. Yeah, I mean, I'm hoping that there'll still be a bit of a lull because it might take them a little while to pick back up with the production. But um, I honestly was expecting it to grind to more of a halt than it did. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I've got talking points on this, but I'll save everyone. Hey, <laughs> let's move on. I'm very excited to talk to you about The Creator, a film I haven't yeah. seen, but I want to know more about. When the war started, they protected me took better care of me than humans would have. They're not people, Maya. It's just programming. Um, I need to preface this by saying that I am obsessed with robot and AI themes in movies and TV shows, and I will watch the crappiest stuff <laughs> on the promise yeah. that it's going to be a robot story. Sometimes when I'm looking for something to watch, I'll just put robot into, you know, the streaming service to see what they've got. And that's how I've found myself watching lots of really strange things. And even in those, you know, that category of the lower tier streaming services where you'll find weird movies from like five to ten years ago that you'd never heard of before, but they've somehow managed to show up here. Surely um, Tubi those... is a great source for all sorts of movies yeah. starring Rose AI. Exactly. I think Tubi was where I saw this movie that was called The Machine and it starred um, uh, Toby Stevens as a, an inventor who invents essentially like an android killing machine and he ends up yeah. having to wreck you this hot lady robot from the army that wants to use her as a super weapon. Um, so I was really jazzed by the premise of the creator because I'm like, robots! And also the way that they frame the movie kind of reminded me of Terminator 2, which is one of my highlight um, robot movies. And I'm a massive fan of the whole Terminator franchise as well. Even Dark Fate. And I end up fighting with people on Reddit about Dark Fate. I think it was, I think it's a great Terminator movie. But anyway, we're not talking about that today. Well, I'm so, going to put it out there. I didn't mind it. Didn't mind it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I Rise, mean, of, Rise of the Machines, I'm perfectly happy to argue against it. But, you know, Dark Fate, fine. Yeah, I mean, and I think um, when they did Genesis, they're trying to reboot it in an, a weird way. I wasn't I didn't really hate that. Either. I didn't hate it. I um, it was fine. Yeah, so the creator. 
I um, was really excited to to see that um, my favourite cinematographer, um, Greg Fraser, was involved as well. Um, Academy Award winning Australian cinematographer, Greg Fraser. Um, and also Gareth Edwards. I really loved his first movie, Monsters. And I feel that the creator kind of captures something uh, about that first movie, which is it's not so much the the story itself, but the atmosphere I think is quite powerful. Um, and I think that um, people have been talking about the creator and focusing on its unoriginality. They're like, oh, it's just like a mashup of this and that. It's just an unoriginal story. You know, Gareth Edwards isn't really a director. He's really more of a cinematographer. So it's just empty spectacle with nothing good in it. Um, I've also seen people are a bit eh about the, the kind of racial politics of the film because um, just a quick plot summary. It's set in a future, I think it's meant to be like in 2070 or something. Um, there has been a huge nuclear blast in LA, which is what um, the Terminator 2 kind of vibe came from. And as a result of that, AI and robotics has been completely banned in the US and among its allies. And the US is actually trying to stamp out AI and robots everywhere, wherever they are to be found. But then there is New Asia, which is some kind of future coalition between Asian nations, which not only doesn't ban AI and robots, but rather supports them and almost incorporates them into society, into culture and religion. So we not only have the usual tropes of, you know, robot cops, you know, robot factory workers, which we've seen in a thousand robot movies before, but we also have robot Buddhist monks. We've got robot mums who uh, love their human children so much that when the human child dies, the robot turns itself off in grief. Um, and then there's this, this kind of vibe that goes through the film about programming. Um, so our hero is played by John David Washington, um, and he's a special forces guy whose job is to infiltrate the organisation um, that is creating these robots and to basically take out the creator, who is almost held up like a, a godlike figure by those who support robots. Um, and in doing so, he's met this lady called Maya, played by Gemma Chan, who ironically played a robot herself in the TV series Humans, um, you might remember. Oh, yeah, yeah, um, I don't know. yeah. Yeah, which I, I love that show as well. But here she is basically like a robot mechanic and she helps him out because he's got uh, like a bionic, like a prosthetic arm and leg that's like robotic. And I'm like, this is maybe a bit of like a crack in the world building. If the US hates robots so much, why does it allow these clearly very advanced um, prosthetics? But again, the US is held up in this film as a really hypocritical nation, a nation that's happy to use technology insofar as it can pursue its own goals, but not insofar as allowing personhood to a robot. And so that's the real problem that the US has and that um, John David Washington is constantly reiterating that it's not real, it's just programming. Uh, it's Because the thing is, these robots, they're clearly just played by humans and they've CGI'd them in afterwards. The way they move, the way they speak and talk, even if they look non-human, they, uh, they really are uncannily it's it's back in that uncanny valley um the the very human and and he's always saying no they're not human they're not like us but what the film wants us to think about is what if they are like us and in fact what if they are another kind of life that we should allow to be with us so Alison Janney who's weirdly cast against type but I liked it as a kind of gung-ho military leader um she makes a comparison in the movie between um the neanderthals and humans homo sapiens and saying that we were smarter but in another way we were um you know meaner and crueler and we crushed them and so she is likening ai to the new species that's going to crush us but I think that the film is basically saying, no, it's humans who are the meaner species. I mean, after all, in this movie, it's only really the Americans who do things like threatening the life of a defenceless puppy in order to get people to reveal the location of the, the robot base, right? And so it's, 
and, and other, there are other really moving, well, to me, moving moments where you'll actually see robots interacting with animals like their pets. Like clearly the the land and nature means something to robots in a way that previous robot movies say it isn't allowed to. You know how like in every robot movie it's usually set in a futuristic city or like some you know, industrial setting like a factory or a, a space base or something. Yeah. There's this kind of vibe that robots belong in robotic uh, situations and humans are the only ones who are entitled to enjoy like greenery and animals. And like in Terminator, it's dogs who give away the presence of Terminators by reacting badly to them. But here it is the, the robots who are in harmony with nature. And so part of the racial critique that's been mounted against the creator is that it is kind of a bit racist to see this kind of spirituality and this nature associated with kind of Asia and with Asian people and Asian landscapes uh, as if it's exploitative. But I do think it's quite politically important for this to be set in Southeast Asia, considering the US's history in that region, right? The military mm. history. Yeah. And there are some scenes that really uh, are quite confronting when we think about the Ben Robert Smith trial um, in terms of the way that soldiers talk to civilians in those places, like really harsh like you're not a person, which makes it deeply ironic that they're so obsessed with the idea that robots aren't people, but the other people that they uh, interact with, they treat like they're not real people either. So what I like about this film mm. so much is the way that it's trying to trouble those traditional ideas that we've got about where robots belong and what is human versus what is robotic. It It's like human culture is only for us, but they're saying, no, what if, like, we can share a culture? What if we can share a place? And it, it we can even be reprogrammed. So that's that final idea of programming again, is that what is um, learning but programming, right? In Terminator, we see Arnie saying that he's, he's got, like, a, a learning computer in his head, but all people have got learning computers in their heads, right? And that's... That's what's quite challenging is that the creator is saying, what if magic and technology, what if psychology and programming, uh, they're blurred, these lines. And so I think that people who are trying to say this is a shit movie, I think have another look at it. I, I loved it. Obviously, I'm always going to love a movie like this. Even if it was bad, I would still love it. But I think it's not bad. <laughs> I think it's good. And I think that it's one of the most anti-American movies I've seen since James Cameron's Avatar movies. Um, it's refreshingly anti-American. And I also wonder if that is why some people don't like it very much. Yeah. Like, I, don't, I, I always feel it wasn't really that people were reacting against with Avatar, but the earnestness of it. And I'm kind yeah, of wondering uh, yeah. if there's an earnestness to this story as well. Absolutely there is. Yeah. And, and I think it's like... Um, if you find certain things cliched, maybe it is because you don't buy into them. But, like, what is ritual but something that we repeat repeat again? Like, is a cliché a ritual that we don't believe in, right? So, for instance, uh, the basic premise is that um, John David Washington's character, he goes looking for this super weapon that the robots have allegedly developed and he realises, oh, it's a robot child, and this robot child is developing the ability to interface with any other robot or AI device and to dismantle or, like, disarm any weapon that can be used against robots and AI. So for the humans led by the US, that is a dreadful weapon. It's the worst weapon you can possibly think of. But it's actually a weapon of peace. It's a non-violent weapon. Um and the way that she kind of activates this is she does praying hands or she mm. reaches out her hands to, like, lay hands on another robot. And I think some people find that corny. But, I mean, when we think about, like, what is Wi-Fi but a kind of sort of a prayer into the cloud, you know? Um, there's talk in this movie about heaven, which some people find heavy-handed too. But, I mean, what is the cloud? It's, he it's digital heaven and yet we have so much of our lives and our memories housed there. So, like, even when people die, there's talk about preserving, um, you know, what they did in the cloud, like, 
like a digital afterlife. So these ideas have been around for ages. I think that the um, creator talks about them in, in really, I think, quite earnest ways. And I think you're totally right that that is what people have a problem with, with Avatar. They think it's corny. Um, they think it's like vaguely racist and they, they also think it's cliched. Um, but I found both Avatar and Avatar The Way of Water and also the creator emotionally powerful. Its working title was True Love. And some people think that that's a cliche, the idea that like love is a power, um, that connection, which is a, a concept that this film uses in a really interesting and ambiguous way as both the connections that um, robots and machines make uh, and the human connections that are driven by, you know, family and, you know, romance, those kinds of emotions. Um, it's trying to say those can coexist. We can have these deeply romantic and emotional connections to creatures that we don't think of as, as being human. And interestingly, I think that's also why it is set in Asia because there's such a tradition in animistic religions, particularly in Japan, of uh, even objects having a soul or a spirit. And uh, robots in Japan are sometimes said to, to be incorporated into these older religious traditions. And even in Buddhism, the idea of being reincarnated, well, that's just like having your software upgraded, right? <laughs> or, you know, being rebuilt if you get damaged. So I like this movie and the way that it is earnest. And maybe you need to come at it with a, a kind of an earnestness and rather than a cynicism. I think as well that the idea of trying to decode it to figure out, well, this bit of it is from this movie, this bit is from this movie. It's so unoriginal. It's like Lone Wolf and Cub meets Blade Runner, blah, blah, blah. But I think that you're missing that the way that it puts this together is interesting and it, it it's new. But I should also say it's spectacular. It looks fantastic. And I saw it at IMAX on the biggest screen possible, right? And it was fantastic. I loved it. Um, maybe I'm going to be in the minority of people who love this movie, but I, I'm thinking so much about it, um, as you might have guessed, guessed from the rant <laughs> that I just did. So a couple of thoughts off that. First of all, yeah. I was with you totally until you referenced love, and now suddenly I'm out. I've I, I got no time for thing, love. Do you remember, um, like, in, in, in Interstellar, <laughs> um, the way that everyone, when, you know, Anne Hathaway's character was talking about love being this this force that's yeah. driven her into the, the cosmos and everyone was like, oh, love, boo. Gross. It's so corny. But at the same time, everyone was on board for Matthew McConaughey and his relationship with his daughter, Jessica Chastain. So it's like, at what point are we yeah. allowed to be sentimental and at what point is that corny? Think about the way that people, fans of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, will um, they love you know, corny moments, you know, like when Captain America catches the bloody Thor's hammer, everyone cheers in the cinema. That's corny as fuck, right? But somehow people accept that, but they don't accept this the same way. I'm trying to figure that out. Look, first of all, the hammer, it's got a name, it's Mjolnir, but anyway, that's neither oh, yeah, here nor whatever. there. Uh, the other thing is that uh, <laughs> I've got this theory with modern day movie going where Look, I go to the movies a lot by myself, okay? I really enjoy just sitting in the cinema and not have to worry about whether friends have liked the movie or whatever. But I know I'm in the minority. I know lots of people really enjoy going there and feel weird about the idea of seeing a movie by themselves. But I do wonder whether or not the reason why people were sort of churn away from these big screen experiences, which rely on really heavy, earnest experiences to what's happening on the screen or conversations about love, if that's because they're there with friends or a partner or someone else and they're not willing to publicly allow themselves to give themselves into the movie, they still have to maintain a veneer where you don't want to be leaving the cinema with that tear in your eye because you're going to be made fun of for years to come. Um, maybe that's just my social circles. Uh, but yeah, like you're not quite giving into the movie and giving into that movie experience. Yeah, it's so interesting because at the same time, there are mm. whole genres of movies that are deemed to have succeeded if they make you cry. You know, like those horrible, mm. weepy movies where it's the, like it's a romance, but one of them dies and it's like, they died, but they loved each other. Like, yeah. 
I mean, and the thing is, Titanic was also held up as being like a crappy movie that only teenage girls would like because of that kind of stuff. But the thing is, those movies are tremendously successful. And I think that a director like James Cameron, who understands this about like emotions, and he's not afraid to be corny, and he's not afraid to reuse tools that in previous movies and and genres of cinema have been shown to work. Uh, because that's what he wants. He wants this deeply emotional experience. But um, I don't know. I think you are right that there's maybe a little bit of, like, too cool for school going on sometimes. I mean, robots kind of have this vibe of being like a boy thing Um, and maybe it's weird for, like, girl things like love to intrude into a boy thing. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's always the weird thing. So if you think about sort of superhero comics, particularly over the last like 30 or 40 years, as they've really embraced a lot more sort of serial narratives and so much of the serial narratives that exist within comics are based off the standard tropes you find in daytime soap operas. Like they're very soap oriented, they're very romance oriented. And there's certainly an irony thinking about a lot of the Marvel movies, which are so lacking in um, emotion and... um, romance and proper relationships and sex there's no sex in any of these marvel movies there's just something very strange about the way that they've made this jump to the big screen in a serialized fashion which just strips out all the um, human connection that actually exists within the comic book versions of these anyway that's neither here nor there Sorry. But at the same time, people are really, they're clearly starving for this because they do respond in emotional ways to Marvel stuff. But it's like they put those emotions in places that I don't think it really merits. The, the, I don't think the text really holds up, um, like, the emotional readings that some people have to it. It's like, oh, oh, my God, we thought that that character had died, but now they're alive. Or they're just really great friends. Like those kinds of things tend to be where the, the real emotion happens in Marvel. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, Cause it's no more sophisticated than the emotions of a nine year old child. Yeah. And it, maybe the problem is that we do expect a lot of um, childlike properties to grow up with us um, to become adults. You know, yeah. the stories that we consumed as children need to like still be the stories that we're consuming as adults. Like star Wars was clearly like a, a kids movie like it's it was like the kind of movie that kids in the 50s would go and see you know as a serial in the in the cinema before the main feature um but now we've got to have these incredibly dark uh, moments to compensate for the adult viewership and i don't think that darkness is always an appropriate way of making something relevant to adults like what if the idea of like adult love and of changing the way you see the world those could be legitimately adult ideas too but we don't see them as often but we do see them in the creator yeah interesting thing about the last guardians of the galaxy movie which had quite a number of scenes to do with animal torture and they were incredibly emotionally brutal and i did find there was a lot of audience um, reaction and a negative against that and i think it's just purely Maybe there's actually no place for something that's that adult in these sort of kids' texts. And I say this as someone who actually quite enjoys getting along to these Marvel films, and I'm not all superheroed out. I don't get the superhero fatigue. I'm there for them. But I do think that the problem for a lot of moviegoers is that these are the only movies I see in the cinema. And because that's certainly been the case for the last uh, 15 years now, it just means that Mm. films like The Creator, which are going out there to do something a little bit sort of bolder and different while still talking to the same audience, I just don't know the audience necessarily either A, there for it, and B, know to how it reacts when they actually see it presented on screen. So there is a brand new production on Netflix, which is a little bit interesting to me. It's called The Wonderful Story of Henry Sugar. This is a Wes Anderson short film. Is it even a short? Is it a special? Who can even say? Let's listen to a clip and we'll come back. Good evening, Mr. Sugar. Said the man behind the desk whose job it was to never forget a face. Henry Sugar was 41 years old, unmarried and rich. Strange. The following is what Henry read in the Little Blue Exercise book. Gentlemen, I'm a man who can see without using his eyes. He saw it, I cried. He saw that trolley. This is absolutely unbelievable. So the reason this exists is because Netflix ended up paying just over half a billion dollars to the estate of Roald Dahl to do some stuff with their properties. 
Uh, part of the deal was not just the big things like BFGs and whatnot, but also the other works of Roald Dahl. So I don't know about you, Mel, but when I was a kid, uh, one of the things I used to do is I'd go to the library with strong memories of Matilda and BFG and the witches and all the other books that we all know and love. But also I'd find the collections of Roald Dahl stories that were for adults and were well beyond what I probably should have been reading, but I still gave it a go anyway. Such was my interest in Roald Dahl. And this comes from one of those short stories. Go just like it. you. Um, yeah, Dan, just like you, I used to be a massive Roald Dahl fan, read all the kids' stories and then found my way into the adult stories, which were quite depressing and disturbing at some point. But that's the funny thing about Roald Dahl. There was always this macabre current running through even the most you know, childlike of his stories. Um, but as for Henry Sugar, I'm sure I've read it, but I can't really remember much about it. It's got to do with playing cards. Am I right? Yeah, kind of. So look, I'm sure like I was watching this and it seemed all very familiar, but I couldn't really work out if it was just that I had a sense of what the story was or if I actually did have a long lingering memory from reading this as a kid. Uh, but what we've got in a special here, it's 39 minutes in length, sorry, 41 minutes in length, I guess 39 plus some credits. Uh, uh -huh. And basically what it's doing is it's Wes Anderson engaging in something that's really frustrated me with the last couple of Wes Anderson projects, which is uh, when he did the, oh gosh, uh, what was the film that everyone went gaga for a few years ago in the hotel, uh, Hotel Budapest. Yes. Yeah, when... Yeah. So when Hotel Budapest came out, one of the things people liked about it was the way the story sort of served like a babushka or a nesting doll. And so it was kind of like a story within a story within a story. And he got so much praise for that. It just sort of seems like he wasn't really able to shake the idea that that's kind of what he should be doing with all of his stories going forward. If you look at the following films, like they all have some sort of nesting doll type story structure to it. And even in this 41 minute short film, He's still doing the same thing. Like it's a book within a book. That's a story being told. Like it, it's just a little bit much. That said, I think I probably enjoyed this a heck of a lot more than I have most Wes Anderson things for the last couple of uh, movies at this stage. Uh, while it does frustrate a little bit by being a sort of a book within a book, what I kind of enjoyed about it was that the film couldn't feel more lo-fi if you envision a Wes Anderson movie. It's not like it was black box yeah, right. theater by any means. Every background is basically a static image and it's certainly a bit more creative than it sort of sounds, but it just kind of feels like there are any sort of deep sets at all. Like it's very much, I mean, it's Wes Anderson, so it's always going to be static images sort of throughout the piece, but it just kind of feels like all the sets are incredibly static as well. And not, not really spaces that one sort of moves within. If anything, it felt like a throwback to 1950s, like um, anthology TV stories where you've got sort of single sets, settings, for the most part. Um, I like this where you've got lots of characters who are in those kinds of environments, but turning around and addressing the camera, recognizing that they are speaking, not necessarily to the audience, but to the narrator of the story from the previous sort of nesting dog structure. And it really plays around a lot with that structure and is just more playful and fun than I think I felt maybe with Asteroid City, where it seems as though the nesting structure was to add a extra layer of gravitas and serious to the, seriousness to the whole affair. This is an opportunity to actually play around with form and structure and just expectations of that relationship between audience and characters on screen. So pretty fun in regards to that. The story of it all, it's basically, sorry, trying to work out how to even tell the story of it. Um, <laughs> It's a guy who has been ostensibly um, kind of a um, Roald Dahl figure, I guess, uh, played by Benedict Cumberbatch. Oh, sorry, not Cam Benedict Cumberbatch. Uh, it's the, um, who is it? It's uh, Ben Kingsley, I think. It was Ralph Fiennes. No, Ralph Fiennes. And Ralph Fiennes is playing Roald Dahl, I believe, but I don't know if they actually address him as that. But he's a Roald Dahl figure who is telling the story of how he was asked to tell the story of a guy <laughs> who's played but it's a bit much largely it's about a guy who is uh excited by the story of a yogi who is able to lev uh, levitate he goes to learn from the yogi how to levitate the yogi says no but it will teach him something else and that is how to be able to see without using his eyes so for his entire life he has gone out there to try to 
Oh, he's acting in circuses and performing as the man who can see without eyes. But the man who is reading the story of this guy without eyes um, is so taken with the story that he then goes to learn how to see without eyes himself and realize it's a really hollow experience. And so he then ends up dedicating his life to ripping off casinos by using his newfound abilities to be able to see the world without using his eyes by card counting. Oh. Yeah, the That's cards the card come in. Card thing. Yep. So he's card counting and then finds that to be a really hollow experience for his own financial gain. So then finds great joy and value in giving that money away to charities and orphanages and whatnot. Uh, that's that's kind of the story, but the story is unimportant because it's really about the presentation and just the overall vibe and aesthetic of being in a Wes Anderson world. And while I found it to be a chore the last couple of films, it was a warm blanket, 41 minutes of television. Uh, hugely enjoyable. So it sounds as though it's catnip for Wes Anderson because he's it's not his first role, Dal Rodeo, is it? Having done oh, Fantastic, well, Fantastic Mr. Fox. Fox. Yeah. yeah, which at the time I was very dubious about because I, w- I loved Fantastic Mr. Fox as a kid and it's such an English story to me. I was like... It, how is he going to ruin it by Americanizing it? But I felt as though the material and his approach meshed quite well and the additions that he made to it were in keeping with the story. Um, so I can see why as well the, the nested structure of Henry Sugar might have appealed to him because, as you say, he's been loving that. Um but I guess what I'm curious about is, because I haven't had a chance to watch it myself, um, how do they portray the whole idea of seeing without eyes? Because you know how Wes Anderson has that kind of flat lay vibe where he will put objects down on the space of the screen or show people interacting in a very gimmicky way. Uh, how does he handle the, the key power of this story? So you never see it from his perspective. You see it from everybody's like external to him and just marveling at the fact that he can walk around a man pushing a trolley and be able to step around it without bumping into it. Like it's oh, not right. so much that you're going through the eyes of the man without eyes. Like that's never the gimmick at all. Um, what, what probably is the gimmick is some of the fun casting in it. So Cumberbatch is in it, Ralph Fiennes is in it. But the two that really sort of, I'm sorry, Ben Kingsley as well. Can't forget Kingsley. But the two that sort of really stand out, and this is probably the most fun sort of sequence of the 41 minutes, is uh, two Indian doctors, one played Dev Patel and the other one Rish Day And okay. the two of them on screen together are just, you know, always going to be fun. Yeah, right. So is it funny though? Oh, like it's amusing. Mm. It's wry and amusing in a way that Wes Anderson is mostly wry and amusing with the occasional laugh out loud moment, but you never get the laugh out loud moment in this one. Right. And I'm wondering if maybe it's the kind of thing that just 41 minutes is enough. Like if he'd tried to make this into a movie, maybe it would have been insufferable. Well, I was thinking about this. So one of the things that I listen to and frequently get annoyed by is the Ringer podcast, the unwatchable, not the unwatchables, the rewatchables, the unlistenables sometimes, I guess, but the rewatchables. Uh, <laughs> one, one of the questions that Bill Simmons, who's usually one of the um, panelists on it, uh, he always asks whether this could be a Netflix series. So the idea of blowing out a movie from, you know, if it's 120 minutes to being an eight episode TV program. And I was thinking about this. There's this sequence towards the end where um, the narrator is talking about the way that Henry Sugar dedicated his life to donating money to orphanages and how that's set up and the structure of that. And he sort of talks about it in a slightly slightly episodic way. And it struck me that if you were going to turn this into an HBO Netflix-style TV series, that's what you'd do. You'd blow it out to not be a feature film, but really you'd have like this sort of man going on a quest and all the crazy adventures he get up to while he's you know raising money for the kids. Uh, like that's what you'd do. But at the same time, like that would be thoroughly unengaging and just take it away from the spirit of what this is. I think to maintain the um, integrity of bringing a short story to the screen like this. What they've done is actually probably the right uh, approach to it. They've kept it fairly lean. It's 41 minutes. It's not a huge commitment of time. And I never got bored by it. There was not a single moment where I was like, gosh, this is really sort of stretching beyond my sort of willingness to enjoy the um, 
it's not the Wes Anderson twee. I quite like the Wes Anderson twee, but I guess maybe sort of having enough substance to back up that twee and a couple of the films sort of like that at times, which is where I can struggle with Wes Anderson. But for the most part, I don't think he ever sort of falls into that uh, trap. Yeah, right. I mean, so you said that this is an anthology. Are there other directors handling different Roald Dahl short stories? Uh, well, there's three as part of this bundle, and I think it's Wes Anderson right. across the three. So this is a live action oh, one. Okay. I haven't seen it. The second one came out literally, we're recording this on Friday, and I think on Thursday night they released that. And then I think maybe tonight they released the third one. I'm not sure. They're just kind of oh. dropping them out. But the second one is oh. based on, uh, gosh, what is it even called? Um, sorry, I'm just kind of trying to bring it up. The Swan, which is a story that I don't know. Oh, I'm sure that if, if I found out about the plot, I would remember it. Uh, too large. Oh, oh it's, one of those a small it's one of those boy. super. It's one of those super grim ones, Dan, that I was telling you about. <laughs> the, the one that children maybe shouldn't watch. Um, well, look, yeah. the good news in this one is it only goes for 17 minutes. <laughs> All uh, right. It stars Rupert Friend, Ralph Fiennes, and Asa Jennings. Oh, are these all short stories that appeared in that original anthology of Roald Dahl's that was called The Wonderful Story of Henry Sugar and Six More? That might be that? right. Uh, see, this is the thing. Like, I've got such a loose memory. I remember borrowing the books out from the library, but I don't remember the actual books themselves. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I, I would have read... I would have read them so intensely as a kid, but that was some time ago. <laughs> and I've watched and read a lot since then. But uh... five, ten years at most. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Right. So, oh, when you were saying that it was an anthology, I thought different directors would be tackling different um, Roald Dahl um, stories. Well, so with this project specifically, it's just Roald Dahl. Oh, sorry, just Wes Anderson doing these uh, three short stories. Okay, right. but Netflix had paid a obscene amount of money for access to the Roald Dahl library. So you will see other Roald Dahl products rolling out through Netflix for the next couple of years. And that will no doubt have other writers and directors attached to it. But this is just the Wes Anderson component of that overall. Yeah. Game. Okay, let's let's spend the next just couple of minutes talking about the there's a new SBS drama. Yes. Uh, what's the program called? Is uh, When the Men Were Away? While the Men Are Away. There we go. So, let's let's play a clip. Yeah. Australia's at war again. Join the Women's Land Army. Well, I for one think they'll make a good fist of it. You can call me Frankie. Well, okay. Where do you want us to start? Uh, it's a big job. Women can do big jobs. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> they can. So I was talking about my ABC show, um, Spot. People on ABC freaking love while the men are away. Like ABC <laughs> yeah. viewers, they're they're so into it, and um, it's got that vibe. Oh, I don't know why. So many Australian shows, in particular, um, want to be dramedies. Now, I think it it works really beautifully as a drama. Its efforts to incorporate comedy are really mixed. The tone is strange sometimes in this show. Uh, but I, I really enjoyed it as a period drama. So one of my clusters is <laughs> period dramas. Love them. Uh, and sometimes I find that uh, different platforms have a lot of different kinds of period drama that I'm into. This one is about um, the Women's Land Army during World War II. Uh, so it's a home front drama and it's about, exactly as the title says, all the stuff that's happening while the men, quote unquote, the men being like just the soldiers and the kind of the leaders of this like monocultural society at the time. What about all those people who didn't fit into that category of the men? So we've got obviously women, we've also got Aboriginal people and we've got queer people. And in particular, there's a real um, focus here on uh, lesbianism and like women uh, having sex with women. Uh, and female I, I think that's kind of what lesbianism is. Oh, good. I'm pleased. Yeah, I'm um, pleased. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so the the basic plot is that there's uh, an apple farm and the uh, the farmer, Harry, has mysteriously gone away. They're saying it's to the war, but we know that something else has happened to Harry. Meanwhile, mm. his Italian wife, Frankie, is uh, running the thing, but she can't obviously 
run a whole apple farm by herself. So she gets some recruits from the Women's Land Army, who are two sheltered city girls, uh, to come and help out, along with her um, her Indigenous female farmhand, uh, who is also struggling with having to deal with the local Aboriginal mission and its Christian bosses. And then there is a, uh, a certified coward, a conscientious objector who has refused to go to the war and he's, he's basically gay. Um, so this, they kind of form this weird found family, this, this group, and it's, it's about their kind of struggles to keep the farm going, all the, the new desires that are being awoken in them as they meet each other and discover... <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, what I always love about a war story, that this was a time when the usual morality and the usual kind of rules of society just get suspended because we're having to completely redo what normal life looks like. Um, so that was a time when people who weren't necessarily privileged in society could actually do things that they weren't allowed to do. So historically we saw lots of women entering the workforce and they didn't necessarily go back to the kitchen afterwards. They stayed. Um, like my grandma in World War Two, she was running um, what would today be called like the dairy um, industry corporation it was called the butter board at the time yeah. so like women being in these executive roles these leadership roles women having um you know physical labor like working on farms or in factories that's a wartime thing and it introduces people to the possibility that life doesn't have to be like it always was but there's also this kind of fraught vibe in wartime where you have this idea that society could crumble. Like, what if the Japanese do actually make it to Australia? Um, we might just have to take our pleasures when we can get them, i.e. now. So uh, there was a fantastic book that I read called The Chamomile Lawn um, that was about, uh, in London, a group of young people who are just basically rooting like rabbits because, you know, London could get bombed into oblivion tomorrow. So I, th I think it's nothing new, the idea of focusing on the kind of desires that could happen in wartime. Um I think that the show, it does really favour what is considered progressive today in terms of politics. So the idea of um, economic self-determination, you know, making your own money, supporting yourself, the idea of um, sexual freedom, you know, being able to be with whoever you like and you don't have to be married to them. Um, and the whole like opposition of all of that and in like different sexual identities and orientations as well um, against this monoculture that we had. So the straight, white, Christian, middle class, everything has to be proper. And that in the, the, the show is represented by like the old biddies in town and this constantly rotating series of mares who are all these old white men. And it's like they never last for very long, which is a joke in the show. Um, what I found weird about the show, though, is that sometimes I wasn't sure what was meant to be a joke and what was meant to be serious because it does actually go really dark. Like before we were talking about, you know, you were mentioning the animal cruelty in Guardians of the Galaxy yeah. um, as an unexpectedly dark thing that happened in a franchise that's, you know, it's meant to be the lighthearted side of Marvel, right? Similarly, while the men are away, um, you're thinking, oh, there's going to be like a fun comedy about, you know, what the antics that people get up to. But at the same time, like there's some really grim stuff. Like uh, the gay guy, his dad is a, like a traumatised World War I veteran who's got like a leg stump and, you know, one of those tin face masks that they made for people who'd had their faces blown off in World War I. Um, yeah. So he's clearly been raised in this awful abusive household and then we also see things like um the genuine like threat of cutting aboriginal people off from their cultures and their families that the missions represented through this benevolent quote-unquote christianity it's serious stuff and it's real stuff right but how does that square with some of the jokes and the more slapstick um silly uh, comedy that um the show is doing that i felt it, it sometimes didn't work very very well for me and maybe the same problem that you had with court 
I had sometimes with While the Men Are Away because I felt like it didn't always set the terms for what its comedy was going to be like and and the kinds of um, situations where we would expect comedy as opposed to drama and seriousness. So, like, an example that that struck me is there's this one land girl who's established as being a really good artist and the way they do that is because they show a picture that she's drawn of the other land girl and it's a really unflatteringly accurate picture so it shows that she's a great artist but also it's a joke but then later on she the same chick has a crush on the gay guy and so she draws a portrait of him crying and it's like fan art it's so embarrassing and bad But I wasn't sure if it was meant to be a joke or if it's meant to be her sincerely, you know, trying to bond with him. And it's those uncertainties that I didn't like so much about the show. So it's like, why why even include the funny stuff? That sounds super frustrating to me. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, once I kind of went, don't even think of it as funny, just think of it as a drama, like a regular period drama. I found that once I did that, I enjoyed it a lot more because the acting's great. The costumes and the uh, production design are great as well. Um, and maybe if you stop trying to think, oh, it's got to have like a political satire purpose to it and just think, no, it's just a straight drama, then pardon my pun, it's it's not a straight drama, it's a queer drama, but um, <laughs> yeah. you can give it a- as a regular drama, I think it's much more successful than, like, it starts off with this kind of parody of newsreels and that newsreel voice, hello, women of Australia, that kind of stuff. But then it just totally drops that and never does it again. So I'm like, why did you start the show that way if you weren't going to keep it going? It was yeah. mysterious. To- like, at least use it as a framing device for episodes to follow. Yeah, and I just literally never do it again. Um, And that's so weird to me. Like, I think that the, the dramedy gets used as a way to talk about a show that is essentially just a drama, but it might have a light tone or it might have occasional sort of quirky sort of screwball type elements but comedy never seems to be the focus of a dramedy like they never use the tools of comedy the structures of comedy the rules uh, and the tropes of comedy in a deliberate way to pursue a dramatic aim which Mm. to me is what dramedy can be like I was thinking this is a much more grim example but remember that film Life is Beautiful with Roberto Benigni Um, super dark super grim but it's handled through comedy, and I think that's what makes it powerful. Um, and because so many dark themes do come through in these sorts of stories, comedy can be used as, like, you know, gallows humour or black comedy to help us deal with structural inequalities, with death and uh, frustration in life, but in a way that we can laugh at it and sort of magically feel better about it. Um, But it's like this show doesn't know where to put the comedy or how to use it. Um, But if you just think about it as like a nice melodramatic story, I enjoyed it. And I think that's the level that a lot of ABC viewers um, also might be uh, thinking of it too, uh, as not anything that's necessarily edgy, but as just a regular old Sunday night kind of a show. Yeah, and I think it's been a while since we've had, like, a good Australian regular Sunday night kind of a show. Yeah, I mean, I can't think of one off the top of my head. Um, I mean, I was also thinking in terms of uh, when the while the men are away of the Sullivans, which are, like, <laughs> yeah. so... Like, it's so long ago, and I don't even think... I was too young to really watch it when it was happening. Um, And, of course, it didn't come out on physical media, like, until I was too old to, you know, not want to watch it anymore. So I've really not seen much of The Sullivans, but from what I remember, The Sullivans was much more of a soap opera but set in World War II on the home front. Um, And maybe more of a Downton Abbey of its time. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. No, no, I think that's right. Uh, yeah, much like you, I think we're probably a fairly similar age and yeah, Sullivan certainly existed, but not to a point where I was cognizant. Okay, Mel. So we talked about four things on the show this week. Uh, I talked about Court, which is streaming now on Stan. I also had a chat about the Henry Sugar TV special slash movie. And the full name of that is the wonderful story of Harry, Harry, Henry Sugar. Uh, and that's currently streaming on Netflix. Uh, you talked about... 
I talked about The Creator, which is in cinemas now, and I talked about While the Men Are Away, which is on SBS. Yeah, you can find that one on SBS On Demand. Uh, Mel, it's been awesome chatting. Uh, we were going to have a very lengthy conversation about rom-coms, but we went on so many asides that I think we probably need to spare the audience a little bit. But uh, do you want to tell people how they can find you, what sorts of things you do? Uh, we were going to talk about rom-coms because you wrote a romantic comedy book. It's true. I've, I've actually co-written two of them um, with my fellow film critic, Anthony Morris, who I think you might have worked with at some point. Of course, um, it's not Anthony. Yeah, so uh, the first one was called The Hot Guy, and it's about a guy who's really hot. And the second <laughs> one was called Nailed It, and that's essentially uh, about the tradies who work in the background on renovation reality shows. What if they fell in love with one of the contestants? Um, or so we we wrote those basically from the perspective of being, um, you know, critics. We're watching a lot of stuff. We wanted to make jokes about it. And so they're, like, legit comedies and not so much uh, like the romance is I think always the the focus of a lot of romantic comedy but we were equally focused on like jokes and maybe that's why I liked Court because our jokes are frequently very very silly indeed um so I also am a critic as you mentioned and I write a lot of stuff for screenhub.com.au and you can find me on ABC Radio on Hobart and sometimes on uh, ABC Sydney too. Um, when I'm not being a critic, I am a copy editor and proofreader. So I'm always um, watching your grammar. Watch out. And you can okay. find me online at you can find me online at Incredible Milk. So like think about the Incredible Hulk, but my name is Mel. And that's my username on pretty much all the platforms. Fantastic. Uh, I have shamefully not read either of the books, even though it's been constantly on my mind. I should actually crack one open, so I'm going to have to fire one of those off. Uh, and, yeah, if you do want to check out one of Mel's reviews, obviously they're going to be impeccable with the apostrophes in all the right places, which is probably the most important part for any review, I think. Anyway, folks, this has been Screen Watching. Uh, obviously, my name's Dan Barrett. You can find me at alwaysbewatching.com. There's a newsletter. comes out every day. Sometimes that's too much for people. Such is the power of my words. Anyway, folks, uh, this has been Screen Watching. We'll be back uh, next week. Uh, I'm going to rope in another critic from around Australia. Uh, Mel is Melbourne-based. I'm going to try to find someone in Sydney or South Australia, but I'm on a quest. I'm going to walk this brown earth until I find a critic who will talk into a microphone with me. This is Screen Watching. I'll talk to you next week.